Welcome to the Probate Mastermind Podcast. These episodes are recorded live once a week and are hosted by the AllTheLeads.com coaches. Agents, investors, and wholesalers join the coaches for everything from marketing tips, sales psychology, life deal analysis, transaction engineering, advanced real estate strategy, and personal development. You will learn to get more listings, more deals, and find financial freedom by listening to these episodes. Be sure to catch show notes at AllTheLeads.com slash podcast and join our free Facebook mastermind community, All The Leads Mastermind. Welcome prolific agents and investors from across the country. Today is February 11th, 2021, and this is Mastermind Podcast number 314. We do have two in the queue, guys. We've got plenty of room for more. Just hit star six and then hit one. And let's go to our first person in the queue. First up this week is phone number ending in 8213. Good morning, guys. How are you? Excellent. How are you doing, sir? I'm great. This is Fed. I have a win. So just want All to... All right. We day. like wins. Yes. Please. Yes, sir. Been, I've been consistent with my calls, and it looks like they're paying off. I got a call. I called a PR, left her a message. The next number on the list happened to be the dad who took my information down. Long story short, she called me this week. I reached out to her originally three weeks ago, and it looks like I will be meeting her and her brother, who are both decision makers, this Saturday at 3 p.m. at the house. They did not have an attorney, so I referred an attorney to them. And the beauty is that the attorney then immediately sent me another client back in return. So it's like a double win. Awesome. Good job. How old was the lead, Fed? How long had you been working it? No, this one was actually relatively new. I reached out January 18th. So it was one of uh, the- Yeah. One, from the January list then, basically? Brand new list? That, that, that's correct. Yes. Yeah. Yes. That's great. So yeah. my, my question- Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry about that. No, I was just going to say, that's good to hear. We, a lot of, we we spend a lot of time stressing how it can take three to six months or longer to convert these leads, and a lot of them do. But it's not uncommon that we'll hear, I got my first set of leads, and I got a couple listings, or I got three listings. So that's good to hear. It does work both ways. And good job you with for you at establishing rapport right away. You It sounds like you kind of made friends with two of them, and that probably helped two of the heirs, and that helped solidify the appointment. And it sounds like it may just be a come get me listing. Does that is that your perception? I, it, it seems like it. So obviously, thanks to you guys, I knew how to. I don't want to say handle the objection, but more just through your guys' help and and the private calls with Bruce. She was steering towards the, hey, let me talk to my brother and then I'll get back to you about an appointment. And I just said, look, since, since we're all busy, let's just schedule a tentative appointment, and if anything changes. Well, we can always change change the date as well. I'm free Saturday in the morning at 11 or 3 p.m. What's best for you? And eventually she just said, look, let's do three. And then I even had an insurance specialist call her to place a vacant home insurance policy on the asset, called her to confirm, and she didn't say anything about changing Saturday. I think, yeah, thanks to you guys. So thank you very much for that. I have a you- question regarding that. So it seems, since she doesn't have an attorney, my impression is that she doesn't have the letters of testamentary yet. So when I go there on Saturday, I was more just trying to establish a rapport and maybe get uh, get a better understanding of the property to see if there's anything we could do prior to that taking place. They did express that they do want to sell the asset. I'm pretty sure that's going to be the case. Is there something... Is it a bad idea for me to go this Saturday since they don't have essentially the the letters of testamentary in front of them and they haven't been to court yet, which is why I put them in touch with the attorney? Or is it good to still go to maintain rapport and just see what we can handle ahead of time? Fed, hey, so I think that you 100% need to go on that appointment this Saturday. What I would do is I would go ahead and take maybe a single page letter of intent with you and essentially just mm-hmm. explain to them, look, if you don't have your letters of testamentary yet, we're not going to be able to do a full established listing. But if you if you want me to go ahead and reach out to my private buyers list and at least start having conversations to see what kind of interest that I have, let's go ahead and sign this. I can 
uh, start having conversations with private buyers that, that I may be working with and then say, and then as soon as we get our letters testamentary, we can go ahead and sign an official listing agreement and get it moving forward. But let's talk about some of the terms that we want to be included in the listing agreement when it comes. So maybe we'll, this will give us a chance to talk about picking a price, picking listing terms, give us a chance to talk about some of the other services that I'm going to offer to you guys included in the future listing. So okay. yeah, do go great. on that yeah. appointment this Saturday and, and try to get something tentative in writing. It's not going to be enforceable if they don't have letters testamentary, but at least yeah. it'll get, a, get an emotional commitment. Hey, we actually did sign something, and uh, they usually won't steer away from it. Okay, perfect. Absolutely. I'll, I'll do that. Thank you. I really appreciate yeah. that. Yep. Great um, job. One other, thing, one other thing. Go ahead, Bruce. Finish. I'm sorry. I'm just going to throw in a couple of other things about your approach so far. Um, a few of the notes that I was taking is number one, this is just a true testament to how you we should absolutely be working down the list and calling people on the list that may not even be the PR. So you had left her a message and then you got through to her father. Great yes. job calling down the list. There's a, a lot of, of good things um, that happen when you call down the list and you start establishing relationships with other family members or, or people that, that sometimes even it's the ex-spouse of the PR. I've heard a lot of good stories about that too. Another thing that I'm going to throw in, you used the classic double bind, which is a really powerful appointment setter where you pick a time. You pick two times, so Saturday, I think you said at 11, or Saturday at 3. It gives the mm -hmm. kind of the illusion or the subconscious feeling of choice when really you're the one that's in control. Now, I'll just throw this in for you and anyone else that is in the habit of using a double bind where they offer two different choices to someone for an appointment time. More and more people, the uh, later, more recently, more and more people are recognizing those double binds. So if you're going to use one, I might also recommend throwing in a, a third option. It's still giving the, the the illusion of choice, but it's not as recognizable. So you might say, I, I have available Saturday at 11 or Saturday at 3. And of course, if those don't times don't work for you, I could also do Tuesday afternoon. What works better for oh. you? Just a thought of throwing in a third choice in case they're sales savvy. They won't recognize it as much. That makes sense. I appreciate that. I'll definitely put it into play. Thank you. Okay, Jim. Yeah, Bruce, that sounds a lot yeah, that sounds a lot less scripted. And what I was going to add, Fed, one of my original mentors in the business taught me that the best way to handle an objection is never to have it come up. And good job when you sensed an objection coming, you headed it off before she even had a chance to get it out, it sounds like. So that's yeah. a really good – that's a good example of listening and responding and avoiding having to answer the objection because you answered it ahead of time. So great job with that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, guys. All right. Great job. We appreciate you. We have two more in the queue, guys. We got plenty of room for more. Don't be shy. Hit star six and hit one. Next up is phone number ending in 0544. You're up next. Are you there? Grand Prairie, Texas. I seventy three six five zero one. you mean. Different numbers showing up, but that's okay. It's you, so go ahead. All right. All right. Thanks, guys, for taking my call. Hey, I just thought I sure. just had a win from a December call, followed up with two letters and then followed up with a call. And she had just gotten her letter of testamentary in North Carolina for her brother's house here in Texas. She told me that she already had four realtors lined up, but she was flying out this week, and I could free to call her this week when she got in, in case somebody canceled. I did do that yesterday and led with the foot that, listen, I've been at this for 18 years as a real estate agent, sold over 850 houses. I just did my parents' estate. I am sure that I will have more value for you, so it would be worth your time to at least meet with me. And she agreed. So I am going there with my estate planner today at 4 p.m. I consider that a win that I at least got to the doorsteps. So anyway, it's working. Huge second win. thing, I'm sorry? I just said that's a huge win. You can go on with your second thing, and I'll hold my comments. Uh, okay. Bruce, by the way, while you're commenting, put my name down again, Mike Reckart, R-E-K-A-R-T. Still want to talk to you about private coaching. All right. I didn't have your last name last time. I got it now. Reckart, R-E-K-A-R-T. Perfect. Oh, so the, not monument of title, as I've heard it say here, but muniment of title that my probate lawyer tells me is how it's pronounced. 
I'm having a lot of people get the fact that, listen, we have to wait for the hearing data. I don't have my letter of testamentary yet. But Muniman of Title, I've got a classic case that I just can't get to the table. This is a, a actually past client of mine whose father is fastly approaching dementia. And they've got a, a investment house that I have actually sold and bought and rented out for them. But they want to sell it. It is all ready to go and has been moving ready, but it's empty. But I gave them a probate lawyer and did get them to get his affairs in check after the mother had died. And my lawyer, although I'm trying to get a hold of her, is that I recommended is telling them that they can't do anything now until they have the hearing date three months from now. Now, I really do think that the market is going to change as people leave the uncertainty of the election bruja and the uncertainty with COVID as we all get vaccinated. So I expect that I'm going to see a surge in inventory here. Right now, my sellers are pirates. They're getting over asking price, multiple offers. So I'm trying to do the best by this client. And for a long, long story short, sooner is better for them. And the lawyer is saying, no, you can't do anything. We're in Texas. There was a will from the mother, even though both names are on the house. And we got, or at least I've heard that we've got that, no, you have to wait for the hearing. This is the same lawyer who told me just a month ago that another lawyer who was saying that it was just their opinion that we couldn't sell the house, put it up for sale and sell it. Now, I'm not talking about the funds necessarily going anywhere, although the main beneficiary in this case is the surviving spouse. But is there something I'm missing? I hate to go toe-to-toe with a lawyer and say, wait a minute, what about Muniman of Title? We should be able to sell the house put it up and sell it and just not distribute the funds or distribute the funds only to a trust vehicle. No, that's okay. No, you were very clear. Very, It was pretty concise, actually. The attorney you're dealing with is you had recommended them or they found her on, you, they found her on no. their own? I think because of my venture with you guys, that was my recommended attorney. Listen, you don't have a trust for Joe. You got to get a trust. And he's got a million dollars worth of real estate coming in this trust, but this is one of the first ah, $275,000 houses that is an investment. But he's got a lot of property, oil and cattle property that I pushed the alarm for them to get into a trust and got them this trust and probate lawyer outfit here in town that I'm trying to build a relationship with. And my own lawyer is saying that now. I call it my lawyer, well, only the, in that it was my recommendation. Yeah. The person is not deceased, though, so it, it's a trust to avoid probate, correct? So it, it, it doesn't necessarily probate. correct. Yeah, they don't have the trust yet. They are trying to do the trust and the relationship with the lawyers because I pushed them in that direction. So they don't have a trust. I gotcha. But before that, the property was owned as an investment property by a man and wife. The wife, unfortunately, died just recently. So the older man who is facing dementia and is getting his affairs in order with the help of his daughter, who is my longtime client. So right. they love it to death that I saw this coming and I'm helping them and guiding them, but now are very frustrated that they got to wait three months, especially after I've told them that I believe the market's going to change and we're going to get swamped and we may and, not have the demand that we're going to have. One more clarifying question. So he, sure. when his wife died, he was – in title with her, with the right of survivorship. So as long yeah. as when she passed, okay, so it doesn't have to go through probate for him to be in control and for him to okay. do something with the property. No, I've run into that before with a husband and wife, even though we have muniment of title here in Texas, that if there was no will, then all kind right. of all bets are off. You got to go. You got to go through the probate anyway, even though the outcome's still the same. And in fact, the sure. first more if there's more credit than just the note due on the house you are probably not going to be able to do a title either so we had to wait now we were in that case no will debt beyond the house in fact it, it was a hoarder's house and went very well with all the people that i got to the party but we were able to put it on the market and not close but be in tight it be in contract with a closed date several days after the hearing. So all of that was gotcha. possible and allowed us to get into the market 
before everyone at the end of the line knew the gates of Disneyland were open. I think that you got a we used to call it a fast you got a fast pass, right? <laughs> so you didn't have to wait yeah, in line. Exa- yeah, exactly. Yeah. And that's the analogy that I really clung on. It seems to resonate with people, but. That's why I'm pushing so hard, not just for a close for bucks for us, but, hey, let's do it fast because the market is insane right now. And, again, I'm not understanding why if I have a will, I have a survivor spouse. I I don't know. Maybe I need to come in. I know. I know. Yeah, Bruce and Tim both have answers for you, but I think if you hadn't referred the attorney, I would probably say – Go ahead and get the property listed, and if a contract comes along, just tell them it's going to be a protracted closing. But because you brought the attorney to the table, I think I would just call the attorney and ask her if she's accessible. Just ask, Have you done that? Have you spoken to her and ask her why? On the last one, one of the first ones I got with you guys, the last one I had mentioned this case coming up, and believe it or not, this is hilarious. She said, client attorney privilege, I can't really talk to you without their permission. I'm like, oh, you got to be kidding me. I referred you and you can't talk to me about it? What I, I'm, going what I would, through the, I'm going through the grade go that I just sent them an email. Please ask her for, or tell her you, I have permission to talk to you about it. So, yeah. Even if it was a generic conversation, hey, I referred these people to you, and here's the situation, and, and just put it to her like you just said to us, I don't feel it's in my – I understand we may not be able to close for three or four months – but the market's so hot right now, I don't feel like it's in our mutual client's best interest to put this off. So would you be okay with me go ahead and listing the property? And if we get a contract, I'll call you, tell me if it's a four-month closing, fine, and we'll give it enough time to close that make sure by the time we close that the trust set is set up and you can use it as a vehicle to close. I, I think I would just put the question to her the way you put it to us and just ask her and, again, come from that perspective that it's in the client's best interest and you're supposed to both be serving them. Uh, Bruce, I know you had something too, or Tim, go ahead, Tim. Yeah, I was going to say along the same lines as that, not only ask that, but say, we're always trying to do the right thing for the client. And the same story that you said, in your, your professional opinion, the market is potentially going to change and max value is not going to be the same as it is today in four months, potentially. And you say, you know, I can't, no one can predict future, but I would want to not only put it on the market and get it under contract, but also put it under market and make the point to the attorney that you want to put it under contract and get several backup offers because of the fact that closing is likely to be protracted based on what she said. That way you're making it really clear to the attorney she's doing her client a disservice and you really do know what you're doing. The backup offers will potentially seal the deal in terms of saying the right thing to the client. Tell your client the same thing. Yeah. Yeah, let me ask you a clarification question, Bruce, and I'm sorry I haven't let you talk yet, but how is it that you guys understand muniment of title? What is muniment of title supposed to do? I thought it's supposed to get us a letter of testamentary or at least a pass somehow that we can move some of these assets around because it's a formality for the rest of probate to go through. To be honest with you, I, I don't understand muniment muni- of title. I understand what monument of title is in Texas. but in, It's just a different uh, pronunciation. It's the yeah. same thing. Oh, yeah. yeah, and I was actually kidding you from our last call on the pronunciation only because the lawyer <laughs> corrected me. One is a Texas yeah. accent and one's not. Yeah. No, I would just... I was just going to say the monument of every state, virtually every state has a vehicle for carving the real estate out and allowing an early closing. So I don't think monument of title is too much different than what we do here in Florida, where you got to go get a judge's approval. So I don't claim to completely understand the legal process, but I know it's a a tool and it works. So go ahead, Chad. Did you, Bruce, you had something to add? I'll first off, I'll echo what you just said, that most states have a tool. It just so happens that Texas calls theirs a monument or a monument or however you pronounce it of title. The majority of states out there, if, if it appears that there are enough assets to cover debts and taxes, most states have a, a resource like that to be able to carve real estate out, go ahead and put it in the heir's name. And then now you are dealing with what I believe and not my non-attorney now opinion here. Okay, so I've got to make sure that I get that out there. I believe that you're dealing with a uh, beneficiary asset. So there are beneficiary assets that don't have to pass through probate. 
and then there are non-beneficiary assets that do have to pass through probate. And if, if this was a husband and wife, then right. and and one had um, joint if it was joint tenancy with right of survivorship, then the ownership interest of the deceased should immediately pass without going through probate the to the surviving spouse without needing to go through probate. So it it shouldn't matter. Obviously, you want to check with an attorney on that. I think that your attorney is wrong. And don't get me wrong, some of my best referral relationships and attorney relationships, they're wrong on things sometimes. They're not always hey, Bruce, an expert if, in every area. Yeah. I didn't want to, if I could just clarify and, and, and let's ask let's ask him. It, my understanding is that isn't really the issue. The issue is that they're setting up a trust to avoid probate when the current owner dies. And I th your attorney doesn't want you to do anything until the trust is completely set up. Is that accurate? I, I can totally understand how you would have taken that from me, so I apologize for being unclear. No, it's just something's happened. And, it, and Bruce may have put his finger on it. I probably need to check because it was an invest property, investment property that there was joint tenancy with right of survivorship because that, okay. I think, can throw a cog, cog into it. And it's they want to sell the house because this house is – he's not fully – not with all his faculties yet, so they don't need to sell anything else. It's just this one is sitting here, and they know that there's so much behind this when the faculties are lost. They're, he can't manage any of the assets, so he's – the ranch, the, all of the property. Gotcha. So they're trying to send off the ones that are. So the trust isn't in place yet, and this is more about this singular property – that happened to be an investment. Gotcha. And, and I think you guys really helped me walk through it, that I need to check on that joint tenancy with Tim, I think, survivors. Yeah, Tim has one more follow-up point. Tim, go ahead. Yeah, I, so let me, I, I heard one of the things you said earlier in the conversation. Is there, in terms of looking at this, forgetting the specifics of all of it, if you look at this as an estate of this man's estate, is there debt owed over and above the value of the property? Nada, nothing on anything. Okay. The okay. guy was all cash thing. Okay. It, it also so, may be it also may be the size of the estate because I think the general guy on the title is that under a million or less and no debt. Well, it could so be, it could, if anything on the property. Yeah, it could be any of those things. But the typical challenge with this is that there can be other assets that also are lumped in with just this estate that the the court or someone else is looking at and the full muniment of title and, and you are pronouncing it correctly as is is indeed not applicable just to the property itself and i think i'm going to go back to what you know they said earlier you really need to because it's something that may come up more often as property values go up and other stuff like that sit down with an attorney and pick them apart until you the right answer about why this is not a doable deal because you don't have all the facts. Yeah, and funny. I tried to sit down with the attorneys, but I, I think it'll be easier after COVID. They they didn't even know how to do a Zoom call. Anyway, offer to buy an hour of their time on the telephone, but you got to you're doing you got to do this and get it done. And I realize you're trying, and you're, I'm not rebuking your effort. But the answer to this is that we can't give you the legal advice. We we don't do that anyway. But more importantly, the attorney is the one that you've already got a relationship with, and you're doing the referral side you know, demand that you get better answers out of them and say, look, I you don't even give me a, do it as a hypothetical. In another circumstance, if here were the circumstances, what would we do and what are the issues? And make it so that you phrase it back to them that they're not playing with attorney-client privilege. Who's a consult? Okay, good, good point. And then a last comment by, we do have five in the queue, so we wrap this up, but Bruce has one last comment. Go ahead, Bruce. So I was just going to tell you that I'm on board with the attorney in this regard, assuming that the that it is not with right of survivorship. It's hard to carve anything out if letters of testamentary haven't even been given, because who's going to be the person that carves that out if it's not a PR that's received their letters yet? So if this is not a right of survivorship asset, then I'm going to I'm going to err on the side of going with the attorney that you really have to wait until those have been given. I think I need to have a conversation with her to really pin this down. Have a conversation know. with another attorney. I, I have seven or eight attorneys that refer me, and if I were to ask this question, I'd probably have five of them all come up with the same answer and two that would give me different answers. So just because they went through law school and they helped 
set up trusts and estates and do probate doesn't mean that they're going to always agree 100% of the time. So always have a few, build build relationship with a few other attorneys somehow. All right, great. Thanks All so right. much, you guys. Perfect. Complicated and interesting case. We appreciate you bringing it to the table. Next up is phone number ending in 0055. You're up next. Hello, nice gentlemen. Mike here. I got a question for you. I know Chad is working on a on 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 a new version of the mastery, and but and and if this is already answered somewhere on a video or something, please point me in the direction. But this is a a, a general asset protection question. And, and just to tell you my setup, obviously I'm doing this this uh, family transitions type business, but is it really a business? I'm not really earning anything. I'm really helping bring together, and I'm, it's really a marketing piece to figure out how I can best serve uh, an estate. So what I've done is I have this subchapter S corporation. I filed a DBA, and I put the name of the, uh, the family transitions thing there. And I also did that for my, my house flipping a company to which which will either take prop title in either the management company or a couple of other uh, LLCs if I ever do take something to flip. So my question to you is, what more should I be doing if, if for this family transitions business? Do I need more than a DBA if I'm not really generating income and having real expenses? If, what's your suggestions? Any ideas? I'll take a first shot at uh, that. The one thing I would tell ahead, you is Tim. that. Yeah, I'm sorry, Bruce. Uh, one thing I would tell you is that we, as we said on the earlier call, giving you legal and financial advice is, we'll give you some general advice. The first part of this is if you don't have an asset to protect, then you don't need don't need to worry about it too badly if you're not taking a lot of money in. However, you need to also look at liability as well. And certainly the one question I would ask you is if you're growing your businesses and all of that, have you looked into any kind of liability insurance? Let's start there. Have you done that? No. Okay. So you, you, if, if you're going to be dealing with anything like that where you've got money coming in and all of that, what you want to do is make sure that you're, you're covering your backside. You want to get the right advice to do that. There's a company out there called Hiscock, A-I-S-C-O-C-K or A-I-S-K-O-K, H-I-S-K-O-K. They're one of the less expensive ones out there, and they offer some good uh, inexpensive single proprietor kinds of insurance. So that's one thing to look at. The other part of it is that, you need to be really careful about your potential tax considerations. And the reality is that if you're doing this and doing it well, you are going to take money in and you need to get advice from your own uh, tax planner, your own CPA and all that sort of stuff. They will also likely direct you to an attorney for the same thing. We're pretty religious about saying you need to be making sure that you've got all your T's crossed and I's dotted in your local marketplace because we have no clue what local issues apply and you've got to get a better answer. And I'm going to go back to the earlier caller, the same kind of deal. Establish a great relationship with an attorney that you can bounce any kind of questions like this off because they can quickly give you the answer. And I'm going to camp on Bruce's. Get more than one opinion because you will likely get multiple answers. And you need to, it's like everybody thinks doctors are religious figures, and they are, but they're human beings. And people have opinions about things. There are certain basics, but you need to get as much info as you can. And you're doing the right thing by making sure you got your act together, but ask the right people in your market. Sure, I appreciate that answer. So I'm going to give you three different um, answers, and they're not necessarily answers, but number one is to the attorney, because you are building a family transitions and a probate side of your business, and doing that, you need good estate planning attorneys and probate attorneys. It's interesting that uh, a lot of business planning attorneys also are either directly partnered with, especially the smaller ones, or or have also do estate planning. So the first thing that I would do to help answer your question is tell you to go look up someone who is a business planning attorney and look specifically to see if their uh, mid-sized to small practice also does estate planning or if they specifically do estate planning. Two of my business attorneys in my market are also estate planning attorneys, and those are the two things that they do. They, I don't want to say that they go hand in hand, but a lot of times you can kill two birds with one stone. You can get your business set up properly, and you can establish a great relationship with that probate and estate planning attorney. The next thing that I was going to say is, as much as you want to do this, I want to caution you, and I'm going to caution you because 
I, I hear this from a, a thousand different people all the time. A lot of people ask these questions, and sometimes worrying about how you're going to set things up can slow you up from the actual money-producing activity of picking the phone up and sending the letters out. So don't let yourself get bogged down in the legal aspects of this or, or the aspects of setting up the perfect LLC. Yes, it should be done, but it's something that can be added in after you're really rolling with your business. So cart before the horse a little bit potentially. And then the last thing I was going to do is I was just going to throw in a, a little plug for Hiscox Insurance as well. Tim spelled it wrong, though, H-I-S-C-O-X. They, they offer great liability and errors and emissions insurance, and I think that's probably one of the first things that you should really get. Beautiful. Now, you, so I've got three hats to wear. One is a realtor, and I don't, I do things in my own personal name if I'm getting a commission. And then there's the investor side of things, which I usually have a an LLC or taken title. And then there's the ma property management side, which is really not a very big, big business, really. You think his, his, his Cox can, can, I have a conversation with them, they can help me out with all three of those? Yeah, it's who I go through. Yeah. All righty. And, and, and that was great advice, by the way. Unfortunately, I, I'm still trying to find guys who do the estate planning that also, because ideally I want to learn about trusts in terms of putting things in land trusts for asset protection when I'm flipping homes or buying homes or rentals. And uh, over here in New Jersey, not a whole lot of them know about that. So you can find an estate attorney, a business attorney, and they'll they'll look at you like a deer in the headlights when you start talking about, hey, I want to structure my flips and my real estate investing with this. And they don't know. So that's I'm sure there's somebody out there, but I'm keep yeah. I'm, I'm still looking for it. A general real estate attorney can do that. I'm sorry. What did you say, Bruce? A a real estate attorney um, can help you with that as well. Uh, obviously, yeah, I, I would, I I would well, imagine I that. It, yeah, yeah, I, I agree. Go ahead, Tim. I'm sorry. We're stepping off, stepping on each other. All I was going to say <laughs> is, if you'll send a request in to support at all the leads, we have possible. Where in Jersey are you? In Ocean County. Okay. Send send a, a thing in to support and uh, ask for a referral to someone in Ocean County that can help you. I may have somebody that I can point you right to do that in Jersey. Sure, it could be Ocean County, it could be Monmouth County. I'm a little flexible with that. And to answer you, Bruce, no, they, 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 the real estate attorneys don't. That's what I was saying. I've not found one, and I've been doing this for a while. I've not found one of them that, that knows about, like, land trusts. So it's just it's challenging. Otherwise, I wouldn't be asking this question. But thanks thanks so much, guys, and I'm going to send that. Uh, I'm going to reach out to his, his cox, and I'm going to also send that email to support. And thanks so much for that feedback. Thank you, Michael. Appreciate it. We've got two more in the queue, guys. We can probably have a couple more jump in. Just hit star six and then hit pound. Or is it star six and hit one? <laughs> star six and hit one. Next up is phone number ending in 6511. You're up next. Oh, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Loud and clear. Okay. All right. Very good. I have a question for you. We are right, joined all the leads back at the end of 2016, and we have – Paid for a bunch of leads back in that last month and then through 2017. But I was talking to support this morning, and I was going, gosh, it would be nice to go ahead and bring all those old leads back into the, this uh, new platform that you have. So my question is, and I've got about, let's see, 927 old contacts through primarily 2017. Is it worth running those through Probate Plus? So when you say bring them back in terms of – are you saying just to get them to go ahead and run them through Probate Plus? Is that your point? Yeah. So I've got 927 leads from four years ago or three years ago. Is it worth going ahead and I, I've got them in the database. Is it worth running them through Probate Plus to see what, what hey, you get? So so yeah. So here's the answer to your question. Take, don't do them all. We could, we'd be happy to take more of your money. But that's not the answer. Don't do them all. Go back and take the newest of the old. In other words, go back about a year and run those through and look and see what you get out of that. And once that's done, you may decide to back up another year and do that. I think maybe four years out, you might get some interesting historical perspective, but that may be a little older even than we would recommend. But I don't know what's going on in your market. It's hard to say. But don't do them all at once. I don't want you to spend a whole bunch of money and then be disappointed with the results. But do them a year back is a really good idea. Yeah, I was going to suggest well, something similar. For me, this is Stephen, right? Stephen? Correct. Yep. Yeah. 
For me, the sweet spot is one to two years old. I do exceptionally well buying and flipping houses in the one to two year mark. I don't know that I've tried to go back two to three or four. And I'm, I agree with what Tim said, start with the newer ones first. But I also would say it just depends on your budget and what kind of ROI you're looking for. To do all of them would be about $1,800. But if you got, I don't know what your average profit is, if you got one deal out of it, it, it may be worth it. I, I suspect there are some in the three- to four-year-old group, it might be 1%. In the one- to two-year-old group, maybe it's 5%. So, so your, your risk-reward ratio is going to be better with the one- to two than the three- and four. But I'm not sure, depending on what your budget is and your appetite for, for how much business do you want and how much you're willing to spend. It, I wouldn't definitely say don't do them all. I think Tim's suggestion of do the do the one or two first, and then if you get any kind of results, use that profit to fund the three- and four-year-olds. It, it's I don't think it's ever a bad idea. There there are some people there that have put it off, and now they're tired of being landlords. They finally have come to a consensus with the family. The sister that was living there has moved on. There's all kinds of issues why people wait a long time uh, to do something. So anyway, it, there, it's not. there's no cut and dried answer, but just depending on what you're looking to accomplish and how much you want to spend. Well, Bruce, you had something you wanted that. to add? Yeah. yeah, I'm also going to tie it to letters. So if you're going to go back through and you're going to market to even your four-year-old leads, and you were, if you were going to send letters to those as well, then – you know, it, it might not necessarily be worth it if you're just going to send one or two letters to that list. But if you're going to do three letters, actually, it might be worth it even with two. If you're going to do mail on top of it, then it would pay for itself just in the people that you were able to cut out of the list. The only thing that I would add to what Tim and Jim said is it depends on whether you're also going to do mail to the to those lists. And if you are, if you're going to do two or three letters, by all means, I think it's worth it. It'll save you money. Yeah, but I yeah, and I hear what all of you said. I'll go back to what Tim's suggestion was. I guess we just take that first group of leads and and see how that kind of works out. But okay, makes sense to me. Perfect. All right, Thanks. appreciate it. Keep working the old leads. Uh, at the beginning of the call, we said work the new. We got an example of working the new ones, but a week doesn't go by that we don't preach to you guys how valuable the older leads are. You've got zero. When you get beyond a year, there, you've got zero competition. Probably when you get beyond six to nine months, there's nobody else that's still in touch with these people. We only have one more person in the queue. I don't think we've ever ended one of these calls early, so please uh, hit star six and hit one and jump in. There we go. we got three now. Next up is phone number ending in 0516. You're up next. Okay. I am in the Austin, Texas area. So my lead that I spoke to yesterday, he's in his 80s. His son passed away age 49. His father and son were both on the title, but the father does not live in that house, so it's empty right now. There's no will, no children. There is an ex-wife who's emptied the house out already. And according to the father that I spoke to last night, he said the attorney says nothing can be done with the property until it goes through probate fully. So I did hear the earlier call of someone in a, not the same, but it, I understand there's something called monument of title now. Is there any additional suggestions you'd give me other than what you gave the previous caller? First of all, what state are you in? Here in Austin, Texas. Oh, okay. So yeah, monument of title does apply. Okay, great. Bruce, but suggestions? There's no, there's no oh, but the father's on the title. Yeah, it depends whether it's a beneficiary asset or not and whether there's right of survivorship. I know I'm just parroting what we said earlier. The mm -hmm. reality is it's pretty rare. I always hate disagreeing with attorneys because most of the time I just don't. I'll go with what they say. But in this particular case, I, don't, I, I just don't understand even if it wasn't a beneficiary asset and even if it did have to go into probate. Into and through probate are two completely different things. And okay. you can almost always, with a few exceptions, almost always sell an asset while it's in probate as long as the money isn't distributed to the heirs. If the attorney is saying that, the, that you can't even list or sell the asset while it's in probate, 99% uh, of the time that's not going to be the case. Now, um, I, I can't speak to this individual, the circumstances around this deal, but you might want to bounce it off of another attorney just okay. as a I'm, I did research. The, oh, I'm sorry. I did research the attorney. You're good. He's under commercial real estate. He's not. He doesn't list probate anywhere on his website, so it may not be something he specializes in. Yeah. 
yeah, I, I would go. I would ask another attorney, or ask the client if they're willing to talk with another attorney. That would probably be the better mm-hmm. the better thing to do is have the client talk with another attorney that specifically does estates and probate. Cool. Okay. All, All right. right. Yeah, Come yeah. back and let us know when you get the deal together. Thank you, Michelle. Awesome. Thank you. Perfect. The last person now in the queue, and we do have room for more. Star six and hit one. But right now, the last one in the queue is phone number ending in 1583. Hey, what's up? I have two questions for y'all. You've you got 12 minutes, so go ahead and ask three. you got plenty of time. Uh, okay. hi, so my name is Travis. I'm in the Atlanta, Georgia area. And the, my first question, when I'm on the phone and after I get through my probate pitch, and then they are, I've been noticing a lot of them lately are stop me and just say, sir, can you please tell me what you want? So then that screws me up because... So I've been trying to, so what do I want? I want to buy the property, I guess, but so what do I want? So yeah, they called me out when they said, tell me, they were like, yeah, stop. I'm like, sure, what do you, so what do you want? Yeah, so. Travis, I would say that, that you're most likely, when we run into that, your elevator pitch, your introduction probably is getting a little long-winded. You've been on these calls before, and you and I have talked before, and I would normally tend to think that you're reasonably concise. But if they're interrupting you and you're getting that frequently, then I would revisit that introduction and that pre- that pitch that you give and see if you can shorten it and make it more understandable. I work with a lot of people who get just confusing, and if if I'm talking to you and I know that we're role playing and I know what you do and I start to even ask myself, what's this guy do again? Then you know that the PR is going to be asking themselves that. So revisit that. I would highly encourage you to get an audio recording software for yourself, something like Audacity or something like that. It's free. Record yourself and then listen to yourself and specifically watch how long it takes you to do that introduction and that greeting. And the the other thing that I would really highly recommend is if you do get interrupted, because it happens to everybody no matter how concise your pitch is, if you do get interrupted, I would practice an active listening technique where you basically just repeat in your own words, not the exact same way that they've asked, but in your own words, repeat what they've asked and then say, it sounds like you really want me to get to the point, right? Of course, they're going to say yes. And then you go, to do that, I guess I probably ought to tell you why I do what I do. Could I do that? So you ask permission to tell them why. So they have explicitly now given you permission to go straight to the heart of the matter. And and that's when I would say the way I put food on my table is by selling real estate. Ultimately, that's what feeds my family. But I also know that when you're going through probate, a lot of times that's the last thing on your mind. You're still dealing with estate sales and property clean out, gutter cleaning and grass cutting and all these different things. And that's why I want to offer you my complimentary service of basically quarterbacking all those other responsibilities. And then I hope that if you ever got to the point where you're going to sell a house, that we could have a conversation about that too. Okay, so that I sounds normally, good. I don't go there until someone has essentially asked me to go there or has given me permission to go there. Okay. Because I know the, the same lady who said that, she, I actually couldn't tell her what I wanted so she hung up on me. She actually hung up on me. And she's on copy no more, hung up. Now, when she hung up, I said, wow. So, look, I called back. I called right back. I said, ma'am, I don't really know what happened, but it seems like our phone got disconnected. And and then, and then she's, I said, I said, why are you so angry? But then she said, well, sir, I'm not angry. It's just that I don't know what you want. And then we actually talked for like 20 minutes. Okay. Get a good why statement. So some, so get a good why statement that shows exactly what you get out of the deal. That's the biggest thing. If they don't know what you get out of the deal, the longer they go questioning themselves or questioning your motives, the less they trust you and the more credibility you're, you're ruining. So get a good why statement that explains what you get out of it and get a good why statement that explains what you're willing to do in order to earn the right to, to do the real estate deal. And you know what? You're 100% right. Over half of them I talk to, they be trying to figure out how you get paid. You get paid somehow. So you're right about the why. All right, second question. I'm in the middle of a deal right now that I have on the contract, but now the brother is a sibling. He's a sibling. The, the mother had two houses. She left the brother and the sister one. I'm buying the sister house. She's the personal representative. But the brother, the brother, he's not on board. He don't want to talk. He don't want to look my way. He's not on board. He's not answering my phone. What do I need? How can I get around get to him? To him. All right, I need you to recap the situation for me one more time. Sorry, everybody, I, I, I got lost there. 
All right, well, black. All right, so I have a property currently on a contract, and the personal representative, she, the personal representative has a brother, and the mother had two houses. She left one to the personal rep, which is a sister, and one to the brother. They're sister and brothers, and they are the, they are the children. Now, the sister house that the mother left her, I have hers on the contract. The brother, he's a sibling. I'm trying to reach out to him, talk with him, get them both on board so we can, you know, finish the process out. I can't reach him. He's not answering my phone, and he don't want to talk to me. Is he How just ignoring you, or do you know that he doesn't want to talk to you? Yeah, he, yeah. I, so I did talk to him once, and when I talked to him, I explained to him what was going on. He was very silent, and now he's just ignoring me. Yeah, he's not mean anything. Okay. He's just ignoring me. Yeah. All right. That I'm not telling you give up on him. Do not give up on him. But you don't have rapport, and you need to just work on gradually and politely following up. Be persistent, but don't be annoying. The more you push for it, the more he's going to ignore you. It, he could just be super busy and dealing with other things and not thinking about you. That's probably what the case is. And he might be intentionally blowing you off. If he's intentionally blowing you off, you're not going to convince him. I could give you the best argument in the world, and it wouldn't necessarily work. We don't know which one of those it is. Just treat him just like any other lead that's in your list that's never answered the phone. Keep delicately following up once a month, once every three weeks, whatever you choose. And and be polite about it. Say, look, it sounds to me like you probably don't want to sell the house. If that's right, please just give me a call back and let me know. But if selling the house is something that you might want to do in the future, I'd love to talk with you. And all I really want is to be included in that conversation if you do. And Travis, I was going to add, do you, are the brother and sister on pretty good terms with each other? As far as Yeah, so as far as I know, I talk to the sister every day when I talk to her. She just says that, you know, and, brother not mad, but they don't really talk on it. And the sister, do you are you buying the house or did you list it and sell it? Yeah, I'm buying it as a cash a cash deal. Okay. Yeah, I might just say to her, Hey, I, I just want to make sure that you're pretty happy with my service so far. Would you mind doing me a favor, like putting a good word with your brother? I haven't been able to get through to him because I can do the same thing for him. We use her as a satisfied past client, see if she'd reach out to the brother. She may or may not be willing to do it, but if she's happy with with the job you're doing and you've done everything you promised, I, you, you may have better luck getting in the side door than trying to kick it in, kick the front door in yourself. All right. Hi, it sounds make, good. You make sense. Now, what was that free service you said about the recording? What was the name of it? All right. Oh, just there There are a million of them out there. One that's good is Audacity. Another good one is Audacity. called Descript. Audacity. Okay. And another good one is called Descript, which also gives you a transcription as well. It lets you delete words out of the transcription. It'll take the audio out. You're really doing this for yourself, though, so that you can hear yourself and understand if you're getting too long-winded. And You've got to think critically and ask yourself, is what I'm doing, is it clear? Is it concise? And am I losing people? And the best way to do that is to listen to yourself. Okay. Sounds good. All right. Thank Appreciate you. it, Travis. Okay. And go – it never fails. We've had six people jump in the queue in the last three minutes. We got time for one more today, guys. The, you other five, if you need help, don't wait till next week. Just reach out to support at alltheleads.com, and one of us will call you back personally. So last up in the queue this week is phone number ending in 6687. You're up last. Hey, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay. So this may be a little bit different. I'm in Ohio. And we actually have, not sure if you're all familiar with it, so I'll, I'll ask first. Are you all familiar with the 80% rule where a property goes in the probate and once it's sold, it has to sell for 80% of the appraised value or, or the county's uh, value? Let me ask you a question because that's something that obviously things like that vary from state to state, but right. that usually only applies if they're, if it's a court-appointed executor is does that a, is that if there is a if there is a executor named in the will does that also apply not if there's an executor named in the will but if there's a pr or right. the will then yes yes okay yeah it's the same thing in california that you have to get court authority if it's not if the pr gets involved if, if there's an someone named in the will you're good it doesn't apply if if the court's involved, then they do. They have an overbid process in California. So I'm not familiar. We're not familiar specifically with Ohio, but that's pretty. That's not unusual in quite a few states around the country. So what's your question? My question was: I've had quite a few 
properties where I haven't been able to get around that, that 80%. So I was just going to ask if they were going to get around that. So uh, you're trying to buy the property? You're an investor? Yes, I'm an investor. I really have properties. So that's, and most of the time when I, when I go and look at them, they're not worth the 80%. So we have to offer less. And the only reason I'm even bringing this up is because uh, I actually just got some misinformation yesterday that I'm actually trying to uh, fight uh, with the, well, not fight, but trying to uh, bring up to the attorney because they told the PR that they could not sell the property while it was in probate. It had to be over with. And when I heard you all say gotcha. that, I was like, so I'm wondering if you all know about this. So that's why I'm asking. This is going to sound a little flip, and I'm, I'm half kidding, but just specialize in properties that have a, a will and executor assigned, and you won't have that problem. But given, <laughs> given that you have it, it, it's not too much unlike a short sale. It, sometimes what will work is do a good job, maybe spend 100 bucks and have a comprehensive inspection done and send a list of everything that's wrong to the executor if you think it's worth, or document it yourself. Go through the property because it's not just – they're probably looking at comps on a computer and maybe help them help the court come to the conclusion that it's that your 70% offer is a, is a pretty good one. And any other ideas, right. Bruce, how we can get around that? No, I would kind of just repeat what you just said there. I've had several fiduciaries assigned to deals that I worked. And once a fiduciary is assigned, it depends where they're getting their appraisal number. If it's just off of a computer yeah. algorithm, then you could provide a different appraisal and have a shot at, um, at getting it. But if they got an appraisal, they're going to have to see proof that that it's not going to sell for 80 percent. And I would just get my offer in and, and, and then resubmit it if it doesn't go for the 80% plus. So you might need to submit your offer a few times, but once that process is started, it's hard to get it out. If you find out that it is a single offer and they've either gotten a BPO or they're just pulling comps in the marketplace, I think if you ask correctly into the whoever the administrator is, say, look, you know, we're trying to get this thing done and we definitely want to go do this. And is there an altern- Is there an opportunity to look for a different appraisal on the property? Sometimes they can accept a substitute BPO or just generally a substitute appraisal. And if they want to work with you, they will. They'll find a way to get this done. One yeah, other thing that just occurred okay. to me. One one other thing that just occurred to me. It sounds like you're a buy and flip, but if you could find an end user, you could. If your margin is tighter, if you need to buy for seventy and you can only get it for 80, you might be able to wholesale it to to somebody else for, for 90, to an owner-occupant. Even some of the wholesalers out there will pay 90%, and they try to find somebody that will pay close to market value. So you might want to find a, either a wholesaler or try to find an end buyer. If it's worth your trouble, it's obviously cutting your margin down, but it also, if you don't actually have to close on it, it cuts down the amount of work you have to do to get paid. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I, and I appreciate okay. all that. I was just curious. I didn't know if maybe you guys just had a one, two, three, four, hey, try this, and that'll get me through the door. But I, I appreciate all the help. All right, sir. We appreciate each and every one of you. We appreciate – we want to thank all of you for showing up today. I want to particularly thank those that actively participated. And I want to challenge each of you to take one thought, one idea, one thing that inspired you on this call – Go out and put it into practice and come back next Thursday and share your results with the group. Be productive, be safe, and we will talk to you same time next Thursday, everybody. 